Thank you all for joining us this evening. I hope that this is an interesting topic and hopefully that we can shed some light um, on your questions and about the topic in general. Um, I have no conflicts of interest. Tonight, we'll review what the different types of incontinence are, as well as what treatment options there are available, including non-surgical options, as well as some surgical options for incontinence. I'll start by just reviewing what exactly it is that I do. So as a urogynecologist, um, I am a physician trained to treat pelvic floor disorders. And pelvic floor disorders include problems with pelvic support, which is called prolapse, when things start to drop or bulge vaginally, bladder and bowel control. We typically do a residency in obstetrics and gynecology, followed by fellowship in our specialty, the official line is female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery. Um, urogynecology is much easier to say. Um, and this is a relatively new board certification, um, so it is a fully recognized specialty. Common conditions we treat include, as I mentioned, incontinence, pelvic organ prolapse, fecal incontinence, voiding dysfunction, which is when you have trouble emptying the bladder or defecatory dysfunction, um, fistula, um, or other complications from childbirth. We'll focus on urinary incontinence this evening. And so what this is, is any involuntary loss of urine. You might hear this referred to as leakage, during wedding, having an accident, there's a wide spectrum of incontinence, um, and it is quite common. So women report any leakage in the past year, um, 25 to 50 percent of women who answered the survey. Um, it increases with age, and something you probably didn't realize, unless it was firsthand knowledge, um, is that 30 to 60 percent of pregnant women will actually have some incontinence when they're pregnant and that may or may not resolve after they give birth. To best understand why incontinence happens, we need to kind of take a step back and understand how the urinary tract is. The urinary tract is comprised of the kidneys. The kidney's job is to filter our blood to remove wastes and toxins. They create urine, um, which is then transported to the bladder through, by the ureters, which are these tubes that connect the kidneys to the bladder. The bladder's job is to serve as a reservoir to store urine until it's convenient to void. And then the last part of the ur urinary tract is the urethra, which is the tube that connects the bladder to the outside. And there's a sphincter or muscle in the urethra, as well as with the pelvic floor muscles, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And the urethra's real job, besides transporting urine out of the body, is to keep urine in the bladder until it's convenient to empty. The bladder itself um, has two main functions, which is to fill up with urine and store it, and then to empty when it's appropriate. During the the bladder wall is supposed to stay very relaxed and gradually expand as the bladder fills up with urine. The muscles of the urethra and the pelvic floor muscles are contracted to keep urine from leaking out. And as the bladder fills up, it sends nerve signals to the brain to tell the brain how full it is so that you can start to make plans about whether um, it's convenient to empty now or if you should be seeking out a place to empty the bladder in soon. When it is time to empty, the brain has made that determination that it's an okay time to empty the bladder, which in these days means that we're actually made it to the toilet and it's time to empty the bladder. To void, the muscles in the urethra and the pelvic floor muscles need to relax so that urine can get out of the bladder and the bladder muscle contracts to fully empty the bladder. Incontinence happens, we can think about this as essentially a failure of the bladder doing its job. So either um, the urethra and pelvic floor muscles aren't able to hold the urine in the bladder so that you leak um, with 
any pressure or physical force on the bladder, like coughing, laughing, sneezing, running, jumping. And this type of incontinence is called stress incontinence. If leakage is happening because the bladder muscle is failing to stay relaxed as it's filling up and it's contracting, that's called overactive bladder when the bladder contracts inappropriately. Um, and the actual incontinence that happens is urge incontinence. Sometimes people have overactive bladder and they don't actually leak. They have a lot of urgency or frequency. Um, but when incontinence occurs, that's part of overactive bladder umbrella and it's called urge incontinence. So as I mentioned, um, stress incontinence is the leakage of urine with coughing, laughing, sneezing, any physical stress on the bladder. And again, this is because essentially the urethra or the pelvic floor muscles are failing to hold urine in the bladder so little bits leak out. Whereas overactive bladder um, is occurring because the bladder is inappropriately contracting and that forces urine out. Those are the two main kinds of incontinence that women experience. There are a few other types that are much less common that I won't focus on today. The third kind of incontinence is called mixed incontinence, and that is when women have both stress and urge incontinence. So unfortunately, this is fairly common, and it can be, it's generally much more bothersome to women if they have both stress and urge incontinence than just one or the other. Um, it's generally a more severe impact on quality of life, and um, it can be quite confusing as to determine what kind of incontinence is actually happening. One of the main reasons we care about incontinence is because it has a huge impact on our quality of life. Now, I think we all know that we're not going to die from having incontinence. This is not diabetes or a heart attack, but it actually has a very significant impact um, on our quality of life. And psychologically, it might lead women to feel guilty, um, to feel depressed, to feel like they've lost their dignity, they fear being a burden on their family or caretakers. Socially, people might reduce their interactions with friends and family because of fear of leakage, or they might um, not be able to do a trip because of um, ability to get to a bathroom. Um, at home, this can lead to issues in terms of like, you know, if you're having accidents overnight and soiling the bedding, that can lead to a strain on relationship. Um, it can have effects on your job can affect your intimacy with your partner and physically can limit activities that people are able to do. For instance, um, if you uh, have stress incontinence, you may not be able to do running or playing tennis that you would like to do because of the leakage that's occurring. When we are examining or evaluating someone with incontinence, the first step we take is to discuss when the incontinence seems to be happening, just in talking to try to ferret out whether this seems to be overactive bladder and urge incontinence when someone's going very frequently and urgently, having to get up at night, leaking when they get that sudden urge to void, or does it sound like it's more stress incontinence and maybe they only leak if they try to jog? Um, we'll ask about fluid intake. Um, the way that our body works is generally what we consume in terms of fluids, we will excrete as urine um, so that our body maintains a level or constant amount of fluid in the body. Um, so there are a number of things in the diet that can um, irritate the bladder and make urgency and frequency worse. Um, so one thing we'll often do um, is what's called a bladder diary where typically for three to three or four days, um, for 24 hours a day, we have um, someone record every time they void and we give it a little measuring hat for the toilet so we can really carefully dial in on how much a person is voiding each time they try to go. Is it a normal amount? Is it a very small amount indicating that their bladder is really sensitive and they always feel like they need to go? If they leak, we record um, that's um, how severe it was on a scale of one to three, and then what they were doing when they leaked, like if they were washing the dishes, um, running water is a common trigger for having an inappropriate bladder contraction, or if they were jogging and they leaked, you know, to ferret out that difference between stress and urge incontinence, um, if there was an urge. And then we also record the fluid intake, um, which helps us 
and a patient, um, an individual really pay attention to how much their um, fluid is being consumed, because that is something that's modifiable that can help with incontinence. And we will do a physical exam um, to look for any physical cause of incontinence. Very rarely we might find a fistula, um, that is quite rare, but there are some other problems that kind of go along with incontinence, um, such as pelvic organ prolapse, like when if you've heard the bladder drops or the uterus drops, um, just uh, make sure we're not missing anything else that could be contributing to the problems. In terms of testing to evaluate incontinence, um, one thing we will frequently do is assess what's called a post-void residual. So what that means is we're trying to determine how much urine is left in the bladder after someone tries to empty their bladder. Um, and that can be done either with an ultrasound just over the pubic area um, or by inserting a catheter to physically drain whatever is left in the bladder. Um, and no one gets every single drop of urine out when they void. It's normal to be able to empty two thirds of the contents of the bladder. Um, and so um, most people actually do empty their bladder normally, but they may feel like they're not because of the oversensitivity of the bladder that goes along with overactive bladder. Another test that we may perform is called systometry. This involves placing a catheter in the bladder, it's shown here, um, and then the other end is connected to a sterile syringe so we can measure how much fluid we're placing into the, the bladder backwards. Um, and this gives us some very valuable information about the sensitivity or sensation of the bladder, the capacity of the bladder. We can see if the bladder is actually having an inappropriate spasm when we do this test. And then we can also evaluate for stress incontinence when the bladder is full. So we just ask someone to cough and see if leakage occurs. And this is all very, very normal in our everyday practice. I know it seems pretty abnormal to the average person, um, but it is um, very, very routine and gives us invaluable information. There are times when a more um, detailed test is necessary to help us um, ensure that the bladder, number one, is functioning in a safe way, and two, perhaps solve some diagnostic dilemmas as to what exactly is happening to a woman in terms of incontinence. Is it overactive bladder? Is it stress incontinence? And it may seem obvious when I explain the difference, but when leakage actually occurs, sometimes women don't even notice that the leakage has happened until after and they're wet. And so it's very challenging for um, a urogynecologist and an individual to determine what the actual problem is. Urodynamic testing is similar to the systometry I just described. So we also place a very small catheter into the bladder, but with this test, there are pressure sensors in that catheter so that we can actually assess the pressures in the bladder as it's filling up and as it's emptying. And your bladder is supposed to stay nice and relaxed as it's filling up, so the pressure is supposed to stay quite low. And if it's increasing, that is actually typically a sign of um, a neurologic problem. And then as the bladder, as a patient, someone is trying to empty their bladder, the bladder should, pressure should increase. Um, but if it increases excessively, that tells us that there could be an obstruction in the urethra. Um, if the bladder fails to contract appropriately, that tells us that there may again be a neurologic problem where the bladder is inappropriately contracting too weakly and um, that can lead to incomplete bladder emptying. During the test, we can also see if the bladder contracts inappropriately as it's filling, which is part of overactive bladder, um, literally overactivity or inappropriate contraction. Now I will focus more on stress incontinence, which is that leakage when you laugh really hard, cough, sneeze, run, jump, lift, bend, any physical stress on your bladder causes leakage. The biggest risk factors for this problem are childbearing and just pregnancy of itself, regardless of how the baby was born, causes some physical and permanent changes in the supports of the urethra. A vaginal delivery is a bigger risk factor for developing stress incontinence than a C-section because there's more physical trauma to the urethra and vaginal supports. 
Um, if you have an operative delivery, which means a forceps assisted delivery or a vacuum assisted delivery, there's a little or even higher increased risk of having stress incontinence later. Age is a very large risk factor for stress incontinence. So we very commonly see that, you know, I just said that delivery is a risk factor. Someone may not have immediate stress incontinence. It may take several years as we age for that to develop. The normal part of the aging process is that, unfortunately, our connective tissue and muscles weaken. And so over time, there is loss of support of our skin, um, of all of um, basically our external organs, and then also our internal organs, specifically the pelvic organs, can kind of start to drop. And for stress incontinence, that is manifested as some loss of support of the urethra, um, which allows urine to leak out. Obesity is, and being overweight is also a risk factor for stress incontinence. Again, stress incontinence is all about physical forces and pressures. And so having increased body weight puts more pressure on your bladder and your pelvic floor and increases the chance of having leakage. There's good evidence that weight loss actually reduces or can even cure incontinence for people who, where that is something that's um, uh, something that they have that could be changed. Treatment for stress incontinence um, starts off with some lifestyle changes. So I just mentioned weight loss. Studies have shown that losing just 8% of the body weight for people who are overweight or obese can result in a 50% reduction in stre stress incontinence on average. So that's pretty significant. Reducing how much fluid intake you have also can be helpful. Um, the more you drink, the more full your bladder will be on average, and the fuller the bladder is, the more likely it is to leak with a physical stress. Another thing on that same vein that can be helpful is emptying the bladder more frequently. We typically recommend on a schedule every two hours for people who are having a problem with this. Um, and the more frequently the bladder is empty, the less likely it is to leak. Another non-surgical option for stress incontinence is to strengthen the pelvic floor muscles. So this is a picture of a woman cut in half down the middle. And so this is the front, the abdomen. This is the pubic bone, the bladder, uterus. This tube is the vagina, and then the rectum and anus are back here. And these muscles are the pelvic floor muscles. And these essentially form a support that keeps the pelvic organs up in the pelvis instead of falling out of the body. And they're, you know, always contracted to some degree to support these organs. Um, and as people age, since all of our muscles weaken, um, these become weaker too, and that can contribute to incontinence. And so we can counteract that by doing specific exercises to contract and strengthen them. And the name for that you might have heard of is called Kegel exercises. Um, we typically recommend doing somewhere between 30 and 50 of the exercises a day. Um, the way that someone does an ex the exercise is by thinking about trying to contract those muscles, um, like you're trying to stop the flow of urine, like you're trying to not pass gas when you have that urge. You can think about trying to draw something up into the vagina and hold it there. Um, and you want to try to hold each squeeze for 10 seconds. I typically will tell someone to try to do that 10 times in a row and do three sets per day. So that would get you 30 of the exercises. Studies have shown that on average, women will experience about 60% reduction in leakage with doing regular Kegel exercises. So a very easy thing to do, very, very low risk, pretty effective at reducing stress incontinence. The other main non-surgical option for stress incontinence is something called a pessary. Um, pessaries are also used for prolapse when the bladder, uterus, or rectum start to drop or bulge vaginally, but they also help with incontinence. Um, so these are two different types of continence pessaries, and this little knob here um, helps support the urethra. So the, the ring is inserted in the vagina, and then it kind of sits with the knob right behind the urethra. And then the other end of the ring kind of sits be behind the cervix or in someone who's had a hysterectomy just on the backside of the vagina there. And 
it's physically pushing on the top of the urethra to help it stay closed when you cough, laugh, sneeze, etc. cetera. Um, this is um, a very safe treatment option. It doesn't cause infections. Um, some people do experience some increased vaginal discharge, um, which isn't necessarily an infection and typically not that bothersome. Um, Studies have shown that this is not actually any better than Kegel exercises. Doing both things is not better than just doing the Kegels, um, but it's sort of an alternative for people who either don't see results with the Kegels or just don't think that they're gonna remember to do them. Pessaries are not a one size fit all type thing. Um, we, they come in a multitude of sizes and shapes. And you know the way that we fit them in the office is to do an exam and then a bit of trial and error to see which size is comfortable, stays inside without falling out, but is not too tight that it um, causes any pressure or discomfort. If a pessary is fit appropriately, it should be essentially not noticed, like using a tampon or back in the days of when diaphragms were used for contraception. Moving on to surgical options, there are a variety, um, and so we'll view all of them. There are a few different kinds of slings that can be done, um, as well as some other surgeries that we'll talk about as well. So mid-urethral slings are the most commonly performed surgery for stress incontinence at the present time. They are considered the gold standard best treatment for stress incontinence. Um, it is probably the most studied surgery in the history of gynecology, so we truly do know a lot about um, how effective it is and also about its risks. There's well over a 90% cure rate on average with a midurethral sling. And what the sling is, um, there are these are the two main kinds shown in this column. So the green is meant to depict what the tape actually this or the sling is. And so it is a piece of synthetic mesh that we place underneath the urethra. And this type is called retropubic, which means it goes behind the pubic bone. So we pass it from the vagina behind the pubic bone and then up to the skin right above the pubic area. The other kind is called transobturator, and again, it goes underneath the urethra, but this one goes a bit more to the sides, um, more towards the thigh. Um, they are, and head-to-head -head studies have shown to be pretty much equally effective. Um, when we put together data from lots of studies that have been done, um, retropubic slings are slightly more effective. Um, so in our practice at B-State, this is the type of sling that we most commonly do. Um, I mentioned that this is a mesh sling. And so it is um, a material called polypropylene, which is a synthetic polymer, not exactly plastic, but something sort of like that. It is the same material that we use for hernia repairs. If you have like a groin hernia or a belly button hernia, um, any permanent implant in the body has some sort of risk of a complication, whether it's a pacemaker, a hip replacement, or a mesh. Um, I mentioned this is a very well-studied procedure. With the current kinds of mesh that we use, there is less than a 2% risk of a complication. Um, I spend a lot of time talking about mesh, as you might imagine. Um, and I'll just say that these are not the meshes that the FDA had concerns about safety. Those were pretty large pieces of mesh that were placed through the vagina for prolapse, and they had really high complication rates, like up to 30%. Um, so these, as I mentioned, less than a 2% risk of a complication from the mesh itself. Um, I will talk a little bit more and show you some pictures about what that actually, those complications look like. Um, the reason that this is considered the gold standard treatment is because it's highly effective and it is minimally invasive. So there are there's a single scission in the vagina and then two very small incisions like a couple millimeters either in the panty line um, in the groin or um, right above the pubic bone it takes about 20 minutes to do the surgery you go home the same day um, it is pretty much instantly effective uh, people are typically back to work in about three to seven days um, there are only restrictions after surgery that we ask that you not lift more than 15 pounds if possible, avoid any high impact and strenuous exercise, um, and no intercourse or anything in the vagina for four to six weeks as healing is happening. Um, the reason that we need people to avoid 
strenuous activity and lifting is that the sling actually isn't sutured or attached anywhere. Um, the mesh has very large pores in it that your tissue or your cells actually grow into. And so your body incorporates it and that's how it stays in place and supports the urethra. Um, so complications. Um, 2% risk of a mesh um, erosion. Um, and so this is what the mesh actually looks like. I mentioned those really big pores. And there's less than a 1% chance risk of us making the sling too tight under the urethra. It needs to be tight enough to work to support the urethra, but not too tight that you can't empty your bladder. Um, and we get that right up over 99% of the time. Um, and that's um, called urinary retention if it happens. Um, and then this is going to be a picture of the vaginal area. So just so you're not totally surprised when I bring this one up, um, showing right, the mesh exposure. So this is the vaginal tissue. This is a surgical instrument showing you um, the exposed mesh in the vagina. And so this is when we talk about a mesh erosion or complication, this is basically what we're talking about, where the mesh was either placed too um, shallow underneath the vaginal skin and it rubs through, or um, in spite of being seemingly appropriately placed over time, it rubs through. Um, oftentimes when this happens, this is a fairly large exposure. So um, this would probably need to be trimmed where we just kind of cut the part that's extruded into the vagina and then the skin there will just heal well over it. Oftentimes it's a much smaller exposure than this um, and just giving someone an estrogen cream will often help the vaginal skin just heal over it and that resolves the issue. The next type of sling is called a fascial sling um, and this is not mesh. It's made out of your own tissue. This is just as effective as the synthetic sling we were just discussing. However, it is much more invasive and it involves either harvesting um, a strong connective tissue called fascia, which is what surrounds our muscles, um, either from the abdomen, kind of like if you had a C-section type incision, or from the thigh. And so this is showing um, the abdominal harvesting of fascia. So you make an incision just like for a C-section or for a hysterectomy, so a low side-to-side -side bikini incision. And we actually remove part of the fascia and that's what we make the sling out of. And then similar to how I was describing placing the synthetic sling from underneath the urethra and going behind the pubic bone, we pass this in the same spot and then stitch it to um, the fascia lower down that's right above the pubic bone. Um, so this involves a fairly large incision. Um, it causes a fair amount of pain to remove this. Um, and it is more challenging for us to make this the right tightness under the urethra. So there is a higher chance up to like 10 or 11% of us making this too tight for someone. Um, so for all of those reasons, it has greater risks and complications than the less invasive synthetic sling, which is why the synthetic sling has largely replaced this. Um, for this procedure, um, the surgery takes at least an hour, possibly two. Um, and people will typically stay one night in the hospital, possibly two, if there's issues with pain control. And this is just showing um, the fascial sling under the urethra here, and then tying it to the fascia above the pubic area there. The next surgery um, is called a birch copal suspension. And what that means is also, it's also called a urethropexy. And essentially, let me just show you this picture. So this is an incision, that bikini type incision. It's not quite as big as this is demonstrating, but um, this is to give us a really good view of what the surgery is. Um, we've opened the, um, the belly cavity essentially, and we've dissected the bladder off of the pubic bone. This is the pubic bone here. Um, and we have placed stitches from this ligament on the pubic bone down next to the tissue, right next to the urethra. So this is the bladder, this is the urethra, and this is showing a, a catheter in the urethra during the procedure. So we stitch right next to the urethra and tie it up to the pubic bone to sort of lift and support the urethra, which helps reduce stress incontinence. 
This can be done either open, like this picture is showing, or laparoscopically, which is much less invasive. It is actually not as effective as doing a synthetic or a fascial sling. It's still highly effective, maybe like in the, somewhere between 80 and 90%, but not of that over 90% range like the, uh, the slings are. And again, this has higher risks than um, the synthetic slings. Um, there's a higher risk of, again, urinary retention or making these stitches too tight, pain and wounding com complications since there's a much larger incision. Um, you've probably gathered, if I actually think I can go backwards, but synthetic slings have really replaced those other two procedures. We still do them rarely. There are certain people who aren't candidates for a synthetic sling, especially those would largely be people who have had radiation to the pelvis for a cancer. Um, radiation affects how well tissue heals and greatly increases the risk of having one of those mesh complications. Um, so for those people, we might do one of those second two procedures, either the um, fascial sling or the, um, the birch urethropexy. Final option for stress incontinence surgically is called periurethral bulking. And this is the least invasive actually of all the surgeries, but it's also the least effective. So this involves um, placing a scope into the urethra and we use that scope with a little needle on it to inject a little filler agent here, right where the urethra meets the bladder and it sort of plumps up the urethra so it stays closed better. Um, and this is probably somewhere in the 60 to 70% success range. Um, this filler agent, there's a few different ones that are used. Um, they can sort of flatten out or slightly migrate either up towards the bladder or lower. So that instead of being nice and plump, it kind of flattens over time and may need to be repeated. Um, this is something that we may use for people, again, who have had radiation. And as a result, the urethra is very, very um, thin. And so injecting this can plump it up to help it stay closed better. Um, and then for other people, even if they've not had radiation and the urodynamic testing shows that the urethra is very, very weak, and this may be an option for them, um, especially if they're not a candidate for a synthetic sling. For any of these surgeries, um, postoperative care may or may not involve a catheter. Um, the reason being is that we're operating right next to the bladder, the urethra, there can be some swelling or like just nerve disruption. The bladder may not function normally right away to empty. So about 20% of women after any of these incontinence surgeries may have short-term trouble emptying their bladder. Um, so they may need to go home with a catheter for a few days until that swelling goes down. And then after two to three days, 90% of people can empty their bladder without any issue. In general, I mentioned the lifting restrictions. Um, we do ask also that you not um, submerge yourself for two weeks in water, so no tub baths, hot tubs, or swimming. And then as um, the vaginal area is healing, there may be some vaginal discharge or light bleeding or spotting um, for a few weeks. That's very normal. Next, we'll move on to the other main kind of incontinence, which is overactive bladder and urge incontinence. This is characterized by your bladder inappropriately contracting like we talked about, and it's often very sensitive. So with just a little bit of urine in the bladder, people feel like they really need to go and they're going very frequently. Um, they're also maybe getting up multiple nines, times at night um, and they might be leaking when they get that urge to go. They just can't get to the bathroom fast enough and that is urge incontinence. So the conservative management um, starts off with a lot of behaviors or things that we can change in our everyday lives. Um, so just explaining, you know, and educating about how the bladder is supposed to work and what's going wrong um, can be very helpful. Um, doing a bladder diary or just keeping track of really how much you're going, how much or how frequently you're emptying and the voided volume can be informative. Fluid and diet management is huge for overactive bladder. So um, if you're drinking four liters of fluid a day, you're gonna have to pee that all out. So that just may be physiologically normal to be peeing really frequently. There are a number of things in our diet 
that can increase the sensitivity of um, the bladder and make that constant sense of urgency much worse. And unfortunately, these are lots of things that are tasty. So coffee is the number one offender. Caffeine is a diuretic. It's like taking a water pill. So it's gonna make your kidneys produce extra urine um, in comparison to the actual volume that you've consumed. Caffeine also directly irritates your bladder muscle and makes it more spastic. So it increases the likelihood of having those inappropriate contractions. So it's really important to reduce caffeine intake to just one, maybe two servings, and I mean like an eight ounce serving of a caffeinated beverage per day. It's important to realize that tea very commonly has caffeine. So definitely black tea has caffeine and green tea does too. Herbal teas don't have caffeine, those are fine. Um, artificial sweeteners can be irritating to the bladder um, and increase that urgency and frequency. Soda has all sorts of compounds in it that are irritating to the bladder. Crystal light has all sorts of compounds that are irritating to the bladder. Um, and so we often have someone sort of do an elimination diet. So really just try to drink regular old water, maybe one or two cups of coffee or another caffeinated beverage um, so that we stay sane. Um, and do that for several weeks to kind of wash out the bladder and remove all those irritants. And then you can sort of gradually experiment to see if you add certain things back in, if they are in fact irritating to your bladder and cause that urgency to worsen. Timed voiding is also helpful for overactive bladder. Um, a lot of women with this problem are voiding very, very frequently, um, but um, some women only have an accident if they've waited too long. So the way to avoid that is to empty your bladder more frequently, like on that every two hour schedule. Also try to restrict fluids four to six hours before bedtime if nighttime urination is a problem. Kegel exercises are helpful for this as well. Um, there's actually a reflex, just like when a doctor taps your um, the right below your kneecap and you kick. Um, if you contract your pelvic floor muscles, there's a reflex with your bladder that is supposed to prevent that inappropriate contraction. For women who are emptying really, really frequently, we might actually have them the opposite of time voiding, try to delay how often they're going to retrain the bladder to get used to holding more fluid. So there are a lot of non-medication, non-surgical things that we can do to help with overactive bladder. And honestly, if someone isn't doing those things, the other treatments we have that are medications and procedures probably aren't going to be able to counteract, you know, drinking four liters of fluid a day. So once we've done all of those first line behavioral or conservative management therapies, the next treatment option is a medication. And Overactive bladder treatment is very much stepwise. So it's step one, all those things we just talked about. Step two is a medication. There are two main classes of pills that we use for overactive bladder. Anticholinergic medications are the older medicines. They've been around for a long time, and there are five of them. So oxybutynin, tolteridine, trospium, darafenicin, and solafenicin, and their brand names are over here. Um, there's also a sixth one called fesoteridine or Tobias that I um, didn't include here. These medications work just as well as the newer class that we'll talk about in a second, but they have more side effects. They can cause dry eyes, dry mouth, constipation, and, um, and especially in elderly people may cause some cognitive effects. So we try to avoid these whenever we can. However, um, the newer medicines are not yet generic, so oftentimes cost is prohibitive um, and makes them not an option. The newer medicines are what's called beta-3 agonists, and the are two medicines. The second one is brand, brand new in the last two months. Mirabetric has been around for close to 10 years. Um, this works on a different receptor in the bladder to prevent those inappropriate contractions. The most common side effect from Mirabetric is that it can affect your blood pressure. Now, typically, this is a very small increase in the blood pressure, about four millimeters of mercury. So if your normal blood pressure is 120 over 80, this we would typically see an increase to 124 or so. So really not you know, a clinically meaningful difference. However, some people are more sensitive and we see it go much higher, um, which would lead them to need to discontinue the medication. 
The newest one um, is called Vibegron or Gemtessa. And this does not have that blood pressure or any other cardiac effects that we know of. So we're all very excited about this. However, it's quite expensive. None, very, very few insurers are covering it. Um, and they do have a coupon program for people, but it only brings it down to $95 a month. And that's not very affordable for anyone I know. The final option um, is actually not a pill, it's vaginal estrogen. Estrogen has a number of effects on the genitourinary tract. And in the bladder, it can help reduce overactive bladder. So in people who are after menopause, um, using a topical vaginal estrogen therapy can be helpful for overactive bladder. Um, this is not the same as taking a pill or using a patch to replace hormones after menopause. Um, vaginal estrogen therapy is very, very low dose. And so not enough gets into your blood system to cause the risks that can happen with pills or patches. Those risks are heart attack, stroke, and blood clots. So those really do not apply to using the topical vaginal estrogen. So this is another option that we have for women. On average, people will see, or when we do studies, we see that any of these pills um, reduce the number of times people void per day by about two episodes and maybe reduce leakage by about one episode. Um, so for some people, they see very, very impressive results and they stop leaking, but that is actually probably not the average um, experience. And there's a very high discontinuation rate of the medications due to that. So after a year, about 80% of people who are prescribed one of these medications will not be taking them anymore. I will also just mention that none of these medications is shown to be more effective than any of the others. So there isn't a best or most effective one. A certain individual may respond better or worse to one of the medicines. So I mentioned that not a lot of people will stay on these for a long time. Um, so we fortunately have some third line options. And these are three procedures that um, people can move on to if they don't have adequate improvement with a medication or they simply can't tolerate the medication due to side effects. The first one is called percutaneous tibial nerve sim simulation. And this is actually pretty cool technology. So this is a form of neuromodulation where we place a tiny little acupuncture needle here down by the ankle. And then this nerve called the posterior tibial nerve arises in your spinal cord from the same levels as the nerves that go to your bladder. And somehow by putting a little electric stimulation on that acupuncture needle, it changes the communication between your brain and your bladder. Um, when we were talking about how the bladder is supposed to function, you know, your bladder is not supposed to contract to empty until your brain gets a permission. So one of the problems in overactive bladder is that your bladder is no longer listening to your brain telling it that it's not supposed to empty. So um, neuromodulation focuses on somehow improving that communication between the brain and the bladder. We don't know how it works, but we just know that it does. Uh, percutaneous tibial nerve stimulation, we abbreviate as PTNS. Um, it involves coming in once a week for a 30 minute treatment and you do that for 12 weeks. And if it's successful, you continue doing that every four to six weeks. There are, are essentially zero side effects from this. It is very safe. Um, it's a huge time commitment, which is a downside and not all insurers cover it, cover it. It is FDA approved, but insurance coverage can be a problem. But for people who it's covered and who have, um, are able to come in for that frequency, it's a really great option. Another form of neurostimulation, so again, improving that communication between the brain and the bladder, it's called Innerstim. And this is essentially a bladder pacemaker. It is actually made by the same company that makes most heart pacemakers. And so this one, we place that pacemaker need um, through the back of the very lowest part of your pelvis near the nerve that goes to your bladder. We do that under x-ray guidance. And then for two weeks, that pacemaker lead is connected to an external pacemaker that you wear in a belt. And you get a trial to see if it works. If it doesn't work for you, you just go back to the operating room two weeks later and remove the lead. That's literally just a single poke on the, um, on the, the back, very low right above the butt. And if it does work, we actually place the pacemaker under the skin. And so this is the pacemaker here and it is placed right below your hip bone above the buttock. Should not be noticeable in your everyday life. Certainly if you feel there, you could feel it. 
Um, this is also FDA approved for um, incontinence. It is also FDA approved for fecal incontinence. So it works for both overactive bladder and troubles with bowel control. Um, so for people who have both problems, this is really, to me, a no brainer that this would be the best third line option for that individual. Um, and this um, is very effective. Um, the pacemaker is controlled by a essentially like a little cell phone app that you get from the company, and it can be um, controlled. There are a variety of different programs utilizing different stimulation and strength of stimulation that can be done. So most people can attain um, a good result and good bladder control with this device. The last option for overactive bladder is actually Botox for your bladder. Botox is one of the most potent muscle relaxants that we have discovered. That's why it's used for wrinkles in cosmetics. It's also for used for other problems with bladder with um, muscle contraction, like in your bladder. So here what we do is we actually put a scope in the bladder and we have a little needle on that scope so we can inject the Botox medicine throughout the bladder muscle. One treatment on average will last six to nine months, and about 15 to 25% of women will achieve continence, so stop leaking totally. The medication will eventually wear off and we'll need to repeat it. It can be done either in the office or the operating room. The main risks of a Botox treatment are having urinary retention, which means trouble emptying your bladder, i.e. that the Botox has worked too well at relaxing the bladder, so now you can't empty it. That will resolve with time, but until it does, someone who that happens to would need to do self-catheterization a few times per day to empty the bladder. There's only a 5% risk of this happening. So this does not happen to 95% of people who use it. 95% of people will not have to do any catheters because they had the Botox in their bladder. And about 20% of women who have the treatment will get a UTI. We give you antibiotics um, when we do the procedure for a few days afterward to try to prevent that, but it still can happen. Um, Botox is probably slightly more likely to achieve continence compared to interstim, but in terms of reduction in frequency avoids, um, number of episodes of leakage, um, they're pretty much the same in terms of um, the Botox versus the inner stem. Neither has been directly compared to the PTNS treatment. I think that is the end. So I did, we made it under, under an hour, so we have time for questions, great. Wow, thank you very much. What a comprehensive talk. So many treatments. Thank you for that. We do already have uh, some questions in the queue, if you don't mind. Um, I don't. If you could um, read them, Sue, that would be great. Yeah, wonderful. So the first one is, um, and of course, we invite everyone else who has any questions to type them in the Q&A box, and we're just going to go through them in order. So the first one is from Jamie. And she would like to know what is going on when someone has a three or four month stretch of stretch stress incontinence, and then we'll have another stretch of time with no issues. This happens over a course of a couple of years. Mm. So incontinence is certainly variable, um, and it's hard for me to give an exact um, explanation for an individual person what's going on, um, but certainly. Um, Stress incontinence is due to a lack of support of the urethra, either from the urethra itself or the pelvic floor muscles. And so during those stretches, it's possible that something in terms of fluid intake has changed, activity level has changed, weight could be changing. Um, something about um, your activity in terms of engaging your pelvic floor muscles more versus another time, it's hard for me to say exactly. Um, some people certainly will have periods of time where they don't have much trouble, um, but the general trend is that over time, you know, as you age, it is likely to become a more common problem. Hmm. Well, thank you. Um, Robin um, has a question. I have kidney stones and was told to drink 90 ounces a day. Should I reduce to less than 64 ounces? Uh, so that is the one caveat I typically tell someone when we're face-to-face -face, is that unless a heart or a kidney doctor 
a urologist or a nephrologist has told you that you need to drink more than that um, for your heart or your kidneys, then you can reduce. But if they tell you you need to drink that much to prevent kidney stones, that makes it really challenging to control um, the the incontinence. Um, but no, I, if you have a problem with kidney stones, um, I would I would keep drinking that higher amount to prevent them because that ultimately um, is a more dangerous problem than having um, bladder control issues. Thank you. Um, Amanda has a couple of questions, but the first one is, what happens if incontinence is left untreated? Mm. So I mentioned that the this is a quality of life problem. And so if incontinence is not treated over time, it will likely worsen. Um, the main, there are generally no life-threatening complications from incontinence. So aside from all of those psychological, social, significant impacts on us, um, you will not die from incontinence. Um, it's very unlikely to have a major complication. Um, that said, the main complications that can happen are really like a dermatitis or irritation of the skin in the external genital area from wearing pads and being wet frequently. Thank you. Uh, the next question uh, from Amanda is, does a pessary, if I'm pronouncing pessary. that right. Okay, good. T pessary, thank you. Does a pessary stay in 24-7 like an IUD? Ah, uh, great question. I did not talk at all about that. Thank you. So pessaries can be managed in a few different ways. Um, the ideal situation is actually that a, a person inserts it and removes it themselves with some frequency. Um, ideally, um, you could insert it in the morning, wear it all day, and then remove it at night. You just wash it with soap and water and then insert it again the next day. Um, the reason I say that's ideal, because if it's the more often the vagina gets to rest without it sitting there, the less likely it is to cause discharge or irritation internally. It can certainly be left in for longer periods of time. Some women just find it very annoying to have to do it every day and might do it once a week or they let the vagina rest overnight, maybe every two weeks. Some women actually can't insert it or remove themselves or just really don't want to have to do that. And in that scenario, it is perfectly safe to leave the pessary in place for three to four months at a time. They come into people who choose that option will come into our office. We remove it, do an exam to make sure it's not causing any significant irritation internally, and then replace the pessary. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Jay just wanted you to know that it's a great it was a great presentation with three exclamation points. Thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. <laughs> um, Carrie um, says that um, she's trying to abide by the half your body weight in ounces of water every day. Definitely contributes to frequency and urgency. Are there health benefits lost by reducing water intake? Yeah, so this is another... Um, area where we kind of run into problems with other specialties or not problems, but competing interests, I suppose is a better term. So yeah, increasing your fluid intake is a common strategy for weight loss, but it's going to make you pee frequently. Um, the 50 to 64 ounces of fluid that I've mentioned is perfectly sufficient to stay hydrated um, and be healthy, but, um, and reduce how often you're having to avoid but this is all, um, like I said, quality of life. And so if there are other competing health interests that are more significant, it's kind of up to an individual to kind of weigh the pros and cons of the different recommendations. Excellent. Thank you. And one thing I'll just uh, say there, um, I'll just expand on, like drinking yeah. water and drinking large volumes of water in general is, is not a problem, it's healthy. And I think that um, other specialties may feel like dermatology may feel that drinking more is better for your skin. And that may be true, but it for people who are having problems with bladder control, it becomes counterproductive. Good advice, thank you. Um, Jamie, whose question you answered earlier, just wanted to say thank you. You're um, <laughs> Mel <laughs> Melanie has a question. Um, is the interstim able to be started in the office or is it an outpatient procedure in the hospital? 
In our practice, it is done as an outpatient procedure in the hospital. It's typically done under a light sedation, like when having a colonoscopy. Um, there are, um, I think, primarily probably urology practices that might do it in the office. Um, we use x-ray for it, and some urology practices have x-rays. Um, but uh, at Bay State, we do it um, in the operating room. Excellent. Um, Robin and Carrie wanted to say thank you to you for answering your questions. You're both. Amanda, <laughs> Amanda would like to know, is cherry juice good or bad for overactive bladder? I've heard both. I would tend to say that pretty much any juice could be problematic for overactive bladder. The reason being is that um, they're acidic typically and um, acidic compounds are frequently irritating to the bladder. Now, this is all kind of a general statement. For an individual, you may or may not notice that it seems to cause urgency. If it doesn't, you're welcome to have any of the things that I've mentioned that could be a problem. That's why we sort of recommend doing the elimination diet um, to just drink plain water and then kind of experiment to see if things are bothersome or not. Hmm, thank you. Uh, Mary would like to know, does the pessary interfere with intercourse? It is possible to have intercourse with the pessary in place. Um, many people choose to remove it during intercourse, however. So that's sort of up, up to an individual what they um, want to do there. Thank you. Um, Amanda asks, is there no surgery for OAB, overactive bladder? Um, there's not a surgery that's curative in the way that there is for the sling surgery. Um, so those three procedures are kind of as close to surgeries as we have for overactive bladder, the, the um, tibial nerve stimulation, the inner stem, and Botox treatments. Thank you. Um, are there any particular pads or undergarments that you recommend? I don't have one brand that's known to work better than the others. I would say that my patients most commonly are using the poise pads. Hmm. Thank you. Um, I don't see any other questions here, so we'll just give everybody just another second. Sure. But um, I just wanted to say that was really a great comprehensive presentation. It was more than I um, expected. And thank you for the great, <laughs> thank you for the great answers to the questions here too afterwards. Um, so it looks like we're at time and I don't see any other questions popping up. So, um, so, oh, wait a minute. Oh, Robin has one more. Speaking of pads, <laughs> which would be better Incontinence, incontinence or menstrual pads? Incontinence pads, definitely. Um, menstrual pads are actually not as good at absorbing urine um, and um, may kind of cause some spilling off to the side. So incontinence pads are typically much, um, much better for people. Excellent. Um, Patricia just says, thank you, Dr. Copse. And I say thank you too. All right, you're all very welcome. Thanks for joining. I hope it was informative. Um, and if you think that we can help you, feel free to give us a call.